Uh, welcome everyone, it's an absolute pleasure to see so many of you this evening. Uh, my name is Ben Ryan, I'm one of the researchers here at Theos Think Tank. The organisations that are hosting it tonight are threefold. There is my organisation, Theos. We are a Christian think tank which provides research, events and comment uh, around the place of religion in public life. And we are delighted to be joined for this in partnership with uh, the Benedict XVI Centre at St Mary's University. Uh, which is a research hub uh, which is looking at understanding research on sociological trends in religious practice and together for the common good uh, which is an emerging movement served by a small charity bringing alive the principles of the common good and encouraging people of goodwill to work together across their differences uh, and that's very much in the spirit of what we're doing here this evening we want this debate to be perhaps slightly different from the way in which migration debates have been run in the past, we want to embody something of the common good, uh, and by that we mean uh, our flourishing, our, ab our ability to live together as a society. And we don't mean that in some sort of trite utopian way, but rather in how do we work across our differences? How do we build things up together? I am so delighted that you're here tonight. And I want to be really clear that you are so welcome here, whichever way you voted on the referendum. When we talk about the common good, one of the things that we mean is that if we take seriously the size and complexity of the challenges that face us, it should become clear that we need all of our best brains, all of our best hearts, all all of our best hands, no matter where you sit on the political spectrum. So the key questions we've asked our panels to reflect on tonight are post-Brexit, how should the British state handle migration policy to best accommodate the interests of our different communities? What should that mean for integration? How can we better imagine a common life together? And therefore, what might a good immigration policy that serves the common good look like? The first thing to say about uh, migration is I think that for too long uh, some very reasonable concerns about the volume and the pace of immigration here but also elsewhere in Europe, as I think a lot of election results now suggest, you know, that, that just, those concerns have been ignored. And I think that not only is a problem for how to deal with migration but also uh, has corrosive effects on democracy because people end up losing trust in political institutions and in uh, elected politicians and others. But democracy isn't only about uh, majority will or the sovereignty of the people, though that is an important uh, component. But democracy is also about how we live together, including with people with whom we uh, passionately disagree over Brexit and over other issues. And democracy is about more than just coexistence. It's also about forming some civic or social bonds, because after all, without those bonds, there's no trust. Without trust, there's no cooperation. And again, democracy is in big trouble. So migrants shouldn't just be seen as people who have skills, and that's why we want some of them, but not others. They are also people with intrinsic worth, and we shouldn't just reduce that to some economic utility or value. The common good isn't simply about, as I said, just adding up things. It's about what enables us to, uh, to live and flourish together. So it's about much more than just wealth or power. It's about that which enables us to live out all of our talents, you know, our vocations, and be valued as unique persons. And then there's this point about mutual obligations. That we can't have a democracy which is just about individual rights or entitlements. You know, you don't just take from society, you also give something, you make a contribution. And you don't just get owed something, you also owe something to others and to society as a whole. I just want to read one quote by Pope Francis, because Pope Francis is often portrayed as someone who's just in favour of migrants and has nothing to say about, if you like, the other side. Absolutely not true. Here's what he says. The church stands at the side of all who work to defend each person's right to live with dignity first and foremost by exercising the right not to emigrate and to contribute to the development of one's own country of origin. In other words, what the Pope is saying is wherever possible, we want to help people where they already are. And we want to help them because we owe it to them if they live in hardship, to help them where they are, but also because it's better for them to stay in their societies. We've gone from an absolute silence about this issue to one in which we catastrophize the issue of immigration at every turn. And the, the politics and the policy have, over that period, brought us to the current juncture at which there are two realities that we face in our immigration system. The first of these is that there is no trust in government to manage immigration in a manner that is efficient, fair, or humane, or to the satisfaction of 
any of the stakeholders to this debate, to the satisfaction of those who have anxieties about immigration and think that it should be brought down significantly, or to the satisfaction of those who perhaps favour a slightly less restrictive or more permissive environment at the border. And no party in government at this point could reasonably command the trust of the public on immigration. Once these immigration is out of control and you, you have a system of targets which have been arbitrarily set, which are perpetually missed, and so it is quite understandable that a sizable percentage of the population view immigration as something that is out of control, because on any policy goal, out of control, uncontrolled, is obviously to the detriment of somebody. Controlled is always better, but what does control mean? And on the other side of this debate, you've got people who work within the immigration system, people who use the immigration system, or whose loved ones, employees, colleagues use the immigration system, and what they see is a system that is deeply inhumane and inefficient. So you've got a situation in which neither of the two positions on this are terribly happy with what we've got in front of us. Neither of them are satisfied, and nobody really wins at this point. And it's a polarizing issue, and that's the second big reality that we've got to face, that immigration as an issue is polarizing in a way that it doesn't necessarily need to be. London's East End has been a traditional first point of settlement for centuries. In most instances, and there of course have been exceptions, which we can discuss later, when the migrant presence becomes too visible and too numerous, compassion and tolerance turn to intolerance and discrimination. At the end of the 17th century, having donated money to help the Huguenot refugees, Samuel Pepys remarked, we do naturally all hate the French. <laughs> Concern over numbers and the migrant impact on national identity is not new to the 21st century. In 1892, the Reverend Reaney, referring to Eastern European Jews in the East End, stated, in face, instinct, language, and character, their children are aliens. They seldom become citizens. In 1982, the focus was on Bangladeshis. There is no doubt that the feeling of insecurity and of being unwelcome persists in all areas where there are European migrant workers. Some are considering going home, others are unsure, though there are those that say they will stay in Britain. Britain is their home. EU citizens are still entering the UK, though that number is falling, while that of those leaving is on the increase. In a climate in which politicians, business executives and professionals in both Britain and the EU are expressing their concern about post-Brexit Britain and the degree of uncertainty that persists, we all need to look carefully at the contribution immigrants make, both from the EU and elsewhere. Sort out the good migrants from the bad migrants and ensure that Britain continues to welcome those from overseas who help make Britain mm -hmm. great. But I think we need to recall that it's only about 3.5% of the world's population who live permanently in countries other than the one they were born in. Uh, the world is not actually on the move. Um, uh, as I think Adrian said earlier, the vast majority of people want to stay in their countries and want to want to develop them, want to reach the kind of levels of <clears throat> wealth and freedom and, and openness that, <clears throat> that our society has achieved over many hundreds of years. People, because the world is now so much more uh, visible and, and transparent through the internet and so on, people, uh, many people are in poorer countries, rather than are, are impatient, understandably impatient, to have the good life now and not to wait for the three or four generations that it might take for their countries, say, I don't know, Uganda, say, to become a country that in some ways is like Britain. Um, and as I say, that is a completely understandable thing, but if, if we allowed that to happen, then I think it would, it would weaken Uganda uh, because, of course, they would be losing many of their most educated and dynamic people. Indeed, there is a kind of, there is a settled will on this issue, and it has been pretty clearly settled now since large-scale immigration took off again in the late 90s. And that settled will, which covers about 70, 75% of the population, think that immigration has either been much too high or a little bit too high over recent years. A lot of people are anti-mass immigration. Relatively few people are anti-immigrant, I would say. Um, and these are very, very different things. And I think the vast majority of people accept the idea of the moral equality of all human beings. 
Um, but they think their primary obligation is to their fellow citizens of all, of all races and religions. Um, so, like I say, we have, we, we've been living in this period of extraordinary openness, and we, we have, the Home Office receives 2.6 million visa applications every year, when often for very short visits, visitor, uh, visitor visas, um, and we still have net immigration of about 550,000 a year. Like I say, these are absolutely um, extraordinary um, levels, and we are going to become a little less open. Um, this degree of openness and the extent to which it was ignored by the anywhere classes is one of the things that has led to Brexit. Um, and people have pushed back. They want a rebalancing. They don't want to live in a closed society. This idea that kind of left v right has been replaced by open v closed is incredibly um, uh, self-regarding way of looking at it, I think. No one wants to live in a closed society, but they want a form of openness that reflects their interests more. Um, that, and they don't want to feel that national social contracts have been undermined, as many people do feel. In order to have a functional and effective immigration system, we need it to serve the interests of the indigenous population as well as the immigrants. And this needs to be implemented by the shared interfaith values with the aim of welcoming others and building a common and prosperous life together. So here are the other important aspects. I would add that this should be a qualitative welcome. So this presupposes the expectation that immigrants become fully-fledged members of the community and thus integrated and happy members. Controlled immigration is the way forward. Controlled immigration is the only way we can ensure we have a full and thriving workforce which can contribute fully. And the controls also should be around cultural diversity, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation and economic status, all of the protected characteristics. It's so important to have a net migration target. The principle of a target will help to hold the government to account and give them a benchmark aim around which policy can be shaped. We need active social cohesion efforts and integration. So from my own experience at the grassroots, the language barrier is an important part of this. Common language is a key mechanism for integration and for full participation in the national and political life here and the immigrants will benefit from the knowledge of the language, and language is also a unifying force and helps to bring friendships. I feel that Britain is a very welcoming nation with a rich diversity, and to continue to welcome immigrants effectively, we need a scale and a pace that will allow us to do so in the best way possible.